Greetings, and welcome to this edition of Scripture, Message, and Hymn, in anticipation of Sunday, the 30th of January. It's a cold winter's day here in Ottawa, but it's with warmth that we welcome you to this virtual space. And so we light the Christ candle, the candle that reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world. Normally, our candle is set in a, a, uh, in a tray surrounded with figures that represent community as we remember and try to emulate how Jesus built a new type of community, one that works at loving God and loving each other. We also normally have a rainbow candle, but this Sunday, we have the opportunity to remember that the Christ candle also brings all of us together and reminds us that we are created equally by God, no matter our income, lifestyle, who we are, or how we identify. And we are looking forward to next week when we'll have both candles back. And so Clara will now read the reading from Scripture. The scripture reading this morning is taken from John, chapter 4, verses 1 to 42. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well? and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may never be thirsty, or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband, and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, 
What do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to complete his work. Do you not say, Four months more, and then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you, and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages, and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony, He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there for two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. This week is United Nations World Interfaith Harmony Week, a week when Christians and Muslims are to look for the commonalities in their faiths. Both Muslims and Christians believe in the same God. Both have as the same commandments the ones that Jesus gave to love God, and to love each other. And over time, this week has given a chance for Muslims and Christians to work together to find common ways to figure out how to establish love of the good, love of the neighbor. And it's in this week that we come to this reading, Jesus' meeting with a Samaritan woman. I seem to be in some sort of musical mode uh, this week. When it comes to this message, every time that I hear the phrase, woman at the well, I think of this gospel song that I heard years ago called Waiting at the Well. It compares us today to the woman at the well, talking about how we're in a state of sin just as she was, and that Jesus is still waiting at the well for us so that we too can partake of the living water. It's a lot of fun to listen to that song. It's pretty upbeat. And the people that are singing it have a great four-part harmony. But I'm not sure that I agree with the interpretation of that biblical story. You know, until the Middle Ages, the woman at the well was not seen as sinful, as much as she was seen as a witness. You'll notice that at no time in this par in this in this um, in this passage does Jesus say something like "Go and sin no more." This woman, living with a man unmarried, after having had five husbands, was truly, as one of the texts I researched said, unlucky in love. She is either widowed or divorced, or a mixture of both. Who knows? under what circumstance she may have been passed from man to man. And it's entirely possible that the man that she's living with now is the brother of one of her former husbands. She's getting water at midday, in the heat of the noonday sun. She has been ostracized by society. So it doesn't go up to get water at the beginning of the day with the rest of the women of the town. She doesn't get to be part of that news slash gossip circle that happens every morning. But here, she, but here she is with Jesus. And she doesn't act like she's in a state of sin. She's surprised by this man. 
this man who's a Jew speaking with her and asking her to share an eating utensil. Highly unusual. And for a Jew, not just a little unclean. One wonders when she asks the question, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink? One wonders, is she angry, hesitant, confrontational? But it's her curiosity that wins out. She becomes interested in this man, this man who speaks of new things in new ways, of things like living water. Compare her status as a marginalized woman and as a Samaritan with that of last week's protagonist, Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a learned man, a Pharisee, someone who is very much in the center of society, indeed near the top of the ladder. But unlike the probably uneducated woman in this story, Nicodemus walks away from his encounter with Jesus perplexed, and he doesn't really get to know Jesus or understand his message. On the other hand, this Samaritan woman is curious about Jesus, curious about his message, and during the bits of conversation that we get to hear, we can see her knowledge of who Jesus is deepen. Wondering about him being a Jew, deepening her understanding to where she sees him as a prophet. Then Lord, then Messiah, and then a savior of the world. There are three details in this story that are interesting. The first one is that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Now, he could have gone around more safely through Perea, I think it's pronounced, which was a Jewish region. But the more direct route was through Samaria. And this is the only story that takes place in Samaria on Jesus's way from Judah, Judah to Galilee on this trip. In the verses immediately following this, he's back in Galilee. It's an interesting detail, isn't it? Just saying he had to go through Samaria almost as if the author of John's Gospel was saying that Jesus and the Samaritan women were destined to meet. Almost as if he were saying that the reason that Jesus went through Samaria was to meet this woman. The second detail includes a bit of humor in that Jesus and this woman are speaking at a well. Part of the research I did pointed out that biblical stories in the Torah which took place at the well between a man and a woman led to marriage. Jacob and Rachel meeting at the same well where Jesus and the woman are meeting. Abraham's servant meeting Rebecca at a well while that servant is looking for a wife for Isaac. And Moses, he and his wife Zipporah met at a well. So it isn't so surprising, perhaps, that the disciples were astonished to find Jesus speaking to a Samaritan woman at the well. They were probably worried and maybe even shocked. Instead, that isn't where Jesus is. We know that Jesus doesn't get married as the readers of this story would have known. But one can almost imagine that as Jesus is going through Samaria, and especially when he starts to speak to this woman, he's getting excited about something new. Something that he hasn't really had time to think of before. That he wasn't just coming here for the salvation of the Jewish people. He was coming here for the salvation of the world. Not just the savior of the Jews, but the savior of the world. He was looking around and where the disciples were seeing Samaritans, Jesus was seeing the harvest of souls that were there for him to reap for God. 
even though he was a Jew, even though the Jews had not sown the harvest of faith of the Samaritans, even though the faith of the Samaritans is so different from ours. And he's there for two days, two extra days in a country which was not necessarily inviting to Jews because building those relationships and building those people's faith was that important. And here's the third detail. When the woman leaves Jesus, she leaves behind her water jar, almost as if she were no longer thirsty, as if she had had to drink of the living water. What was that water? One imagines that Jesus, recognizing this woman's plight and the life that she was forced to live with humiliating circumstances, his compassion touched this woman so deeply, giving this unlucky in love woman the kind of love that she had never had, a love filled with respect, with compassion, with love for who she was. Because, you know, that's what water does, right? It flows to the lowest point. And that's what our relationship with Jesus can do. Because God reaches to us at our lowest point. God reaches to us in our vulnerabilities, our sorrows, our isolation and helps us with a love that we know so deeply in our hearts. And our relationship with Jesus can build us up, build us up like he built up the Samaritan woman. There is salvation in this relationship. She goes back into town and she tells the town people, the townspeople, that she's been talking with this man up on a hilltop all by herself in spite of the risk that she will only be more ostracized because of this behavior. But she has that confidence given to her by the deep love of Jesus, and she gets the message across. And they follow her. They, they, they go to find Jesus based on her words. In the end, the townspeople as a whole are on speaking terms with this woman. Jesus has shown them her worth. This is what being in relationship with Jesus does for us. And as Jesus does that for us, when we reach out to people in loving compassion, we do as much for them. Even if they're not like us. Even if they live on the margins even if they are of a faith with some beliefs that we don't understand, we can reach out to them with loving compassion and respect and build relationships that, are, that, that build up each other's worth. Just Because just like we are Jesus' light in the world, we can be Jesus' living water. Now, it's not, it's not easy. I'm not going to pretend. Let's not pretend. Sometimes to reach out to others, we have to go through Samaria, to places where we aren't comfortable. And we have to see people as they are, where they are. Not condemn them for our perception of their sin. Not condemn them for our perception of their circumstances. Not condemn them for what they believe. But to meet them where they are, when they're there. And so as we go forward into this week, this week that's about building relationships with people who aren't like us, let's remember that we can reach out from the depth of our hearts, knowing that what we have in common is stronger than that which would drive us apart. Deep in our hearts, we know this to be true.